If you're a VHF or UHF operator, then almost certainly at some point in time you're going to be considering the purchase of a Yagi antenna. Here we look at the basics which you might want to consider and then take a look at one of the antennas that are made in Serbia by the Jewel Antenna Company, a range that we are proud to represent. Today I'm in our warehouse at Portsmouth and uh, here along this um, racking is part of our stock of Jewel antennas. Now we've been doing Jewel antennas for nearly a year now and we are the exclusive distributors for Jewel antennas. And if you've been watching these videos you may know that whilst I'm not by nature an avid VHF operator, I have been dabbling recently, I've been using the IC9700 and I have to say that I have enjoyed it, probably because my present QTH is uh, fairly well elevated so it gives me a good takeoff. But what I um, decided to do was to try out one of these dual antennas, not a big one, but the sort of dual antenna that you might use if you've got a fairly sort of regular size QTH. And although dual would suggest that the antennas are dual banders, they're not. Some of them are single banders. But the one I'm going to look at at the moment is a dual band antenna for 2 meters and 70 sems. And I decided to put one up myself. So what better opportunity to talk about it than to actually discuss and show you the antenna as I assemble it and as I install it. So that's what I'm going to do. Now before we get to the antenna itself that I'm going to build, let's talk about the VHF and UHF Yagis in general. Because if you're a newcomer, there are one or two things that you need to appreciate. First of all, you do need low loss coax and we do a range of low loss coax on our website but you do need to use something which has got a reasonable uh, loss so not RG58 <laughs> as much as I've promoted on the HF bands um, you need to use something um, with a, a much lower loss and as I say if you go onto our website you can see the various cables and you calculate how much cable you need and you can see for yourself what the what the loss would be at a particular frequency VHF Yagis can be either vertical or horizontal. Now, in most cases, they'll be horizontal because most people that buy Yagis are going to operate on SSB or CW, where the convention is horizontal polarization. Nothing to stop you using it vertically for repeater use and for talking to mobiles, but generally speaking, the Yagi is horizontally polarized. The gain of a Yagi is achieved by the number of elements, but not only the number of elements. Very important to understand that. You can't have a one meter uh, boom length on two meters and put loads and loads of elements on and expect it to have a lot of forward gain. It won't. A one meter boom length on two meters might have four elements on it, and that is a sort of a typical small Yagi that you might use at home or for portable use. If you increase the boom length and add elements, it's the combination of boom length and elements that gives you the forward gain. And I can recall many, many years ago now, J-Beam saying that as a rough rule of thumb, doubling the boom length increases the forward gain by 3 dB. And it's not a bad reference, actually. So if you have a one metre long boom and you extend it to two metres, add some elements to it, you'll get something like a 3 dB gain, which is like doubling your power. If you then increase that 2 metre length to 4 metres, doubling the length, you get another 3 dB. And you can go on ad infinitum. But, this is a very important but, there is something that you also need to consider. Antenna forward gain is achieved by the adjustment of the beam width. So if, we, if our little sort of four, meter, four element Yagi on two meters has got a, a beam width like that, as we increase the boom length and add elements, so that beam width narrows, gets narrower and narrower. And that's really how the forward gain is achieved. Now, the temptation, and it's very logical, 
is to think, okay, well, I'm going to put the, the biggest, the longest boom antenna up I can because that'll give me lots of gain and I'll work lots of stations. Well, in some ways that's true, but in other ways it's not true. The problem is that as you narrow the beam width of the antenna, so you're seeing a much smaller part of the 360 degree coverage that uh, is available to you. So it means to say that the long boom and the high gain antennas are great for point to point contact, provided you're pointing in that direction. But it does mean to say that you'll not be aware of what's happening over there or what's happening over there. So if you are going to go for a high gain long boom, bear in mind that you're going to spend an awful lot of time spinning that antenna around looking for signals. Uh, in some respects, there's, uh, there's, there's justification of having two antennas. You could have a small antenna just for sort of general listening on the band and then a longer antenna for your DX. But I just make that point because if you are putting up a VHF antenna for the first time, it is very directional and the narrower the beam width, the more you're going to be turning it round. And you might miss a station over there when you're pointing here and a station over there when you're pointing here. If you've got an antenna, smaller antenna with a, a, a wider bandwidth, then you're probably going to hear both of them. I mean, it's not a, it's not a sort of steep cutoff, but it is a, a very noticeable cutoff. And so I just make that point. Think about it before you make the choice. Dual antennas, generally speaking, use end sockets uh, for the connection. And um, you may not be familiar with uh, end connectors, but actually end connectors are very easy to put onto coax. In fact, in some respects, they're easy in the PL259. There's plenty of videos on YouTube. So it's worth looking at a video of an end connector and how to install it on the coax cable. But as I say, it is very simple and in many respects, it's uh, more simple than a PL259, and it's infinitely better. You, uh, end connectors are generally speaking used for VHF and particularly for UHF, so check that one out. So having looked at VHF Yagis and the basics and just given you a few hints from my own personal experience, let's now take a look at the dual antenna that I'm going to assemble myself. This is the driven element here, and you can see the matching unit. If I turn it over, you'll see the uh, the end connector there. All nicely uh, wired, put together. Here's some of the 70 SEMS elements, and they're very nicely machined, very clean at the ends. If I go in close, I'll try and show you how they're all labelled up as well. And I think you can see here that uh, each element is labelled. It's labelled A and B, so you get them around the right way. I mean, you really can't fault them the way they've uh, labelled these antennas. It's impossible, really, to put it together in any other than the correct way. And the two metre elements, of course, are exactly the same, labelled up. And... Uh, Really nice. This part of this tubing, by the way, is uh, solid. Uh, lightweight, but solid, and um, well, it's just uh, very nicely put together. Now the boom is in two sections. You've got these joining pieces here. One goes either side, like that. And they also provide these nuts and bolts already assembled. In actual fact, these nuts are, have got nylon uh, locking pieces in them so they're not going to come apart uh, anytime soon. Let's take a look at how the boom is mounted to the mast. You've got these two holes here. You've got this part of the bracket which sits in there. You've got these two nuts and bolts with the uh, um, nuts again with nylon um, loading inserts. And then you've got this, which sits on top. Perhaps if I turn this around, you'll get the idea better. That goes like that. The mast is gripped there, and that clamps on to the other side of the mast. And these bolts go through like that. Nicely made. I'm not sure what this is, actually. It's, uh, 
it's coated with something but anyway it looks uh, it looks the business and I don't think it's going to uh, be a problem so that's how the boom is mounted onto your mast the elements are attached to the boom using this screw here and there's various holes along there. Now if you look carefully you'll see all these holes are marked. And if we're going close you can see this hole here which is uh, labelled 10AB and that happens to coincide with a 70 sems element which is labelled 10AB. So I know that that side A goes this side because it's got A on it and B obviously goes on the other side and that just goes into that hole there. So it couldn't be simpler. You can't possibly make a mistake. Everything is labelled up. Now here you can see uh, I'm putting on one of the elements and uh, I just need a Phillips screwdriver to screw it down onto the boom. Now here's a shot of the joiner. That joiner is very good, very firm, there's no sag at all, so um, I have every confidence that, uh, well you can hear, you see a close-up. It's, uh, it's nicely engineered, very close-fitting, as I say, no sag. And here you can see the end socket mounted on the boom, and that end socket sits in a plastic housing, so it's completely weatherproof. Well there's the aerial put together and uh, it's actually um, upside down if you know what I mean because the uh, side that's facing up would actually be the side that's facing down. The main reason is because the coax connector is on this side and of course you want that facing down uh, because you can adjust the cable correctly and of course it, I suppose it makes it slightly uh, less likely to get any uh, ingress of water in there, although I have to say that it's all pretty well sealed anyway. So uh, there we are. Six elements on two metres. And uh, I think it's 11 on uh, 70 sems. Just going to go in a bit and just show you that the 70 sems effectively driven element is very closely coupled to the two metre driven element. The two meter driven element is the thick one just on the right and that is directly fed with coax cable via the end socket and then immediately to the left and very close to it is the 70 sems driven element and that is uh, coupled effectively um, to the two meter one and then provides the drive power for the 70 sems uh, antenna. Here's a shot of the mast uh, clamp which will take up to a uh, two inch mast. And here you see the antenna on my mast ready to go. It uh, looks a nice slim line design, low wind resistance and altogether a nice looking engineered antenna. Well having installed the antenna it was time to connect it up to my IC9700 and see how it works. Now <laughs> I have to confess that it coincided with a major opening on 2 metres and 70 sems. Uh, it's not always that you can work uh, into Norway, into Sweden, into Belgium, into Holland. Um, with uh, S9 reports, um, I got some superb reports from Scotland on 70 sems, but it doesn't always happen. So I'm going to give you a few snippets uh, from um, the antenna in action, but uh, it's not typical. But anyway, um, I was pleased to have these contacts and uh, well, anyway, yeah, let's have a look. This is the uh, Dutch station coming through at 5 and 9 plus. A uh, tremendous signal. SM6 VTZ. SM6 VTZ, George 3, Oscar, Japan, Victoria. Golf 3, Oscar, Juliet, Victor calling them by. Good afternoon. It's afternoon here in in Sweden. 
uh, your 59 plus 59 in J058 uniform. And here we have the uh, Aberdeen uh, beacon coming through on the 77s at very good signal strength. And remember that I'm located in the south in Essex and this beacon is right up in the north of Scotland. Your QSL from Golf 3 Oscar, Juliet Victor. I haven't got your full call sign. The call is Golf 3 Oscar, Juliet Victor. You are 55. And that was a Norwegian station. Should explain Oscar, that to the Hotel. camera shakers because I had a, a phone. I just grabbed it uh, while I was working. I was very impressed with the dual antenna and it's really underlined the fact that the engineering of this complete range of antennas is superb and... Although well, I've mentioned it already, the ability to put it together without any instructions is great because, as I say, everything is labelled. The elements on this model are solid, they're quite thin but solid, um, so uh, there's no problem there um, with wind resistance. And it's a light antenna and it could certainly be used for portable work quite easily. I think if you're a newcomer to ham radio or perhaps you're waiting or going to soon have the IC705, then this is, is a, an ideal antenna to look at. It gives you two bands with one coaxial feed, which is a plus, and of course the 705 only has one feed anyway. So that would be great for the 705 or your uh, FT817 um, or your 818 or whatever. I'm using it as a base station antenna and it's it's proving to be very very good indeed. The power handling is rated at 100 watts and I think that would handle that very easily indeed. And overall it's a, a nice package. Jewel also makes some um, single band antennas and having looked at this particular one, the six elements on two and 11 on 70 SEMs, um, it makes me look at the 23 SEMs uh, antennas because they do, so they do one 23 sem, sem antenna, which is only about a meter long. And that would complete the trio for me for the IC9700. So I may well look at that at some later date. In the meantime, if you're interested in VHF Yagis, take a look at the dual range. They're well engineered, easily put together, performance is superb. And I do like the uh, N connector sockets that they provide there because it makes connection very easy. And the N connector, as I said already, is a very easy connector to put onto a coax cable once you've looked at the videos on YouTube. So in the meantime, thanks for watching this video. I hope it's been informative. And don't forget to press the subscribe button. That means to say you'll be alerted when any future videos come up. From us here at Waters and Stanton, thanks for your custom, thanks for your interest. Uh, always glad to hear from you. Phone, email, go on the website, whatever. In the meantime, enjoy your ham radio, have fun, keep safe. Bye.